The Bible reading from tonight comes from 1 uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 to 31. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ, for we are all baptised by one spirit and into the body. We're Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we are all given th- given the spirit to. Dr- we are all given one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made of one part, but of many. If if the foot should say, "Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body," it would not be the reason. Cease be part of the body. And if the ear should say, "Because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body." It would not, for that reason, cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts of in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honourable, we treat with the special honour. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honour to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honoured, every part rejoices with it. Now, you are the body of Christ and each each one of you is a part of it. And in the church, God has appointed first of all the apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles. Also, those having gifts of healing, those able to help others, those with gifts of advice, sorry, those with gifts of administration and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. Are they all apostles? Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret, but eagerly desire the greater gifts? This is God's word. Coming through, all good? Yep. Well, I'm not looking into a camera, and you're not looking into a TV. Praise God for that. It's good to see. It's good to see the Lord's house filled with people. Uh, we're continuing uh, through one Corinthians, and we're journeying our way through, we're approaching the end. Uh, we're reaching a point now where you spend some time in spiritual gifts. If you've been tuning in online, um, but even if you just listen to uh, the Bible reading from Beck, we, we've got a big chunk here it's just impossible to touch on every note so we'll dig into it but I encourage you even through the week do some further study do some more looking into it do some more reading so that you can really mine the riches of it let's pray and uh, ask the Lord to bless this uh, portion of our time of worship Father it's so wonderful to be in your house and uh, we know there's nothing special about the building It is the people, and it is very special for us to be together as the people that you have redeemed, the people that you you sent for, the people that you sent your son to die for. Uh, We were bought with great cost, and so at the thought of that, that your son died for us, we sit here in awe of you, and we long that you be worshipped. Tonight is not about a man. It's not about leadership. It's not about any particular member. It's about you, God. It's all about you, and we want you to be honoured. 
And so we pray for that needful ministry of the Holy Spirit, that he would come and sweep through this place, that every one of us would be gripped and taken a hold of. Lord, we have come to meet with you, and so we ask, oh God, come and meet with us. We long to hear from you as we open up the sacred book. We pray that you would speak and that we would have ears to hear. Lord, we ask these things so that you'd be glorified and your church would be built. And we ask in the name of your Son, King Jesus. Amen. It was in a certain uh, mountain village I was reading in Europe several centuries ago. There was a nobleman there. And as he walked through the village, he was contemplating what his legacy would be in that village and what he would leave to the townspeople. At last, he decided that he'd build them a church. No one saw the complete plans for the church until it was finished. When the people gathered, they marveled at its beauty and completeness. However, someone soon asked the question, But where are the lamps? How will it be lighted? The nobleman pointed to some brackets that were placed around the walls. Then he gave to each family a lamp, which they were to bring with them each time they came to worship. And then he said to them, Each time you are here, the area where you are seated will be lighted. Each time you are not here, that area will be dark. This is to remind you that whenever you neglect meeting with your brothers and sisters, some part of God's house will be dark. That was the legacy that he left them. Now, the nobleman, he was rich. He could have built it any way he wanted it. But he perfect, uh, purposefully decided not to put lights that were fixed into the building. And he left the responsibility of the light within the place up to each of the members. Each of the members had the responsibility. And he was trying to make a point abundantly clear. It is this, that the pastor is not the only necessary one. The eldership is not the only necessary members of a church. From the least to the greatest, everyone is necessary. In God's family, each member. And when one is out, when one is not present, the whole place feels it. That's God's design. So here we are. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and chapters 12 to 14 are on spiritual gifts. So hopefully you've been tuning online. Uh, Pastor Ian has been spending some time going through what the gifts are. As we move forward, once we get to chapter 14, we'll see that the gifts are being abused, and we're going to see some wild things that were happening in the church with the gifts. But we're not there yet, so I'm not going to spend time on that. Uh, but some, some members were thinking because of their particular gift, they were superior to others. And that was causing some friction points. Here in chapter 12, he doesn't get into the, mis- the malpractice of the gifts. He gets into their attitude, their attitude as a church and relating to gifts. So first point, if you're uh, following along in, in the passage here, first point tonight is the church is likened to the human body. The church is likened to the human body. So Paul gives a 101 lesson on human anatomy. Look at uh, verse 12 there. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. The the human body, is saying, is a singular unit. It is one. It's composed of many parts, limbs, organs, and the rest, but the, the glory of the human body is, is this. It has so many different parts that are unique, and yet they combine and come together to form a single entity. No person on the planet has multiple bodies. The body is one. And the human body is amazingly profound and complex. I have a few uh, images here just to look at some of them. Uh, Chris, if you can pull it up. The human heart, for example, as you can see it there, every year your heart, every year your heart pumps enough blood to fill an entire Olympic pool. Every year. We have some 60,000 to 100,000 miles of blood vessels within our body. So if you were to take out all of our blood vessels and you were to line them up end to end, it's long enough to go around planet Earth four times. That's within your body. 
Every second, our body produces 25 million cells. Every second. Next there, you'll see... Uh, oh, not yet, sorry. Uh, the lungs, if we move in. Uh, or oh, we can go to the tongue. The, the tongue that God has given us, one of the strongest muscles in the body to talk and to taste. I found it fascinating that our tongue has over 2,000 taste buds. 2,000. It's a lot of different meals you should be trying. Our lungs breathe in around 11,000 litres of air every day. The eye, if you have a picture there, we have, it is said, 2 million working parts within our eye. 2 million working parts. And if you were to liken the eye to a camera, it would have 576 megapixels. So to give you an idea, the iPhone 13, which is our advanced technology, has about 50 megapixels. The eye has 576. The brain, you'll see on there, sending messages to the whole body, dependent on the lungs to bring in oxygen, taking 20% of the body's oxygen, sends, nerves, uh, sends the nerves impulses at the speed of 274 kilometers per hour. Your brain is sending messages to the nerves. Our brains have approximately 100 billion neurons in them. 100 billion. And time would fail us to talk about our liver, our fingers, our hands, our nose, the muscles, tendons, and you could keep on going. Thanks, Chris. This is what God has created. And David, King David, he didn't know all these facts about the human details. He didn't know all those finer details. But he knew enough to say in Psalm 139, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And I'll praise the Lord for that. I know it well. David knew that. And so out of all God created in the universe, the human body seems to be the most glorious of all his created works, immeasurably complex, individual members of size and function, so remarkably different. And yet, in all of their differences, they combine to this glorious, harmonious symphony, this, this one entity, the human body. And, and so, so singular is this body that if one limb is severed off, if it is removed, that limb will wither and die. It needs the rest of the body so why the science lesson? Well, verse 12, he says, Though all its parts are many, they form one body. And here it is, so it is with Christ. So it is with Christ. Christ's body has many members. Christ's body has many members. And God decides to use the human body as the metaphor to describe the church of Christ. The human body, that, that glorious thing that we just saw there. And we are called Christ's body. Now, he could have likened us, right? If he's into metaphors, he could have likened us to the universe, a universe that's made up of heaps of galaxies and stars. He didn't do that. He could have likened us to the beach and said all of us are like singular grains of sand that make up the beach. He could have done that. But he chose to use the human body. Why? Because so many different people, so many different members that are dependent on one another, making up the one body. Look how different, though, we are. He says there in verse 13, it's made up of Jews, Greeks, slave and free. This, this body of Christ is made up of different ethnicities, different social classes. And you could add to the list there, it's made up of the rich and the poor, the young and the old. The wise and the unwise in many ways. So many different people, one body. And the question comes, how can such dissimilar people be considered one body? They're just so diverse. They're opposite in nearly every way. How can they be considered one body? Think about marriage, right? You have two becoming one flesh. Two sinners becoming one flesh. In and of itself, that's a miracle, right? So how on earth can you have dozens of people who are sinners and radically different? How can they become one body if even marriage is a miracle? Well, the answer is simple. Because of another supernatural miracle. What's the other supernatural miracle? Look at verse 13. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body. Whether Jews, Greeks, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to, uh, to drink. 
And so do you see it? The many, the many mem- members encounter one divine being. The many are confronted with the one, the divine. And the many experience the powerful working of the one. The many are confronted by the one, the divine. And it says that one spirit, this is the Holy Spirit. Notice the two workings of the spirit. We were baptized by one spirit into one body, and we were all given one spirit to drink. Spirit baptism is the first thing that he says here. This isn't water baptism that it's referring to when it says we're baptized by the Spirit. It means we were immersed by the Spirit. We were submerged, plunged by the Spirit. And He made us one with Jesus, and He made us one with His new family. And this happens, this baptizing the Spirit happens the moment a person is converted, the moment they are saved. They go from unspiritual to spiritual, to not having the Spirit, to having the Spirit. Galatians 3 says the same thing, verse 26. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus, for all of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. And now there's neither Jew nor Gentile, all are one in Christ Jesus. You were baptized into Christ. How did it happen? By your faith in Christ Jesus. And the Spirit submerges you. You are immersed in the Spirit, and you are immersed into this one body. He grafts you in. This flood of the Spirit brings you in and you get crammed and knit together into this body. Supernatural. A kind of science can't really help you with it. It's just supernatural. And the second thing he says that we were all given one Spirit to drink. This is the reception of the Holy Spirit, right? He doesn't just do this work, this impact upon us. We receive the Spirit. He comes into us. We partake of Him. And Paul says here, we have all drunk of the Spirit. Paul includes himself. What's he saying here? The same Spirit is given to apostles, to the poorest Christian, to the simplest Christian, to the newest Christian. You have the same Spirit as the apostles had. We all have tasted of this drink. It's the divine. And so our unity here, the unity that we have, this oneness, is a result of our shared experience of the one Holy Spirit. And therefore, the application is, we must be alert to to anything that would threaten our oneness, right? Anything that would threaten our oneness, we need to be alert against it. Let me quote David Garland. He says this, Quote, what may polarize the world does not or should not divide the church. Now, there are many current issues dividing society, and we cannot allow them to sever limbs in the body. We can't. We cannot because God sent Christ to die for us, to make us one, and then the Lord Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to gather us and bring us into oneness. Christ died for our oneness And the Spirit was sent to gather us and bring us into oneness. So that's the first point. The the church is likened to human body. Secondly, this evening, being a body means there's no place for envy. There's no place for envy. Now, verse 14, if you just look at it, he repeats what he's already said there. The body's not made up of one part, but many. He repeats that. And he does that so that now he can flesh out. He's given you the metaphor. Now he can flesh out the implications of what it is to live as a body, right? Because we're different parts, it means we're going to have different roles. We're going to have different functions. But because we have different roles and different functions, this can lead to friction. This can lead to friction in the body. Look what he says in verses 15 to 16. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body... It would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, well, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. So what's Paul addressing here? Remember, remember the context is the diversity of gifts given to Christians. The Spirit gives different gifts. And now Paul wants to encourage those who feel that they've received less from the Holy Spirit. They, they were kind of been kind of sent to the back seat of the car while others get to ride in the front seat. They get less from the Holy Spirit. And this is important. Paul is speaking about a prevalent pain in the church. 
that's often felt amongst Christians. This is, he's talking about the Christian who feels inferior. The Christian who feels insignificant, they feel lesser than other Christians, they feel worthless. They have the mindset that, you know what, I, I don't really have anything to contribute. I, I don't have much. And, and the example that Paul gives is, is of a foot saying, well, because I'm not a hand, I'm not part of the body. Or the ear saying, because I'm not an eye, I'm not really part of the body. They feel less significant. What does this look like practically? Well, I don't preach. I can't lead a Bible study. I'm not really gifted to lead singing or to lead music. I can't evangelize like other people in the church. And it comes down to almost to the point of, I could leave the church and nothing would change. Everything would continue to go on smoothly and nothing would change. The kingdom wouldn't be impacted in the least with me leaving This is very common. This is a very real struggle amongst Christians in the church. And this was what was happening in Corinth, right? A number of them were given the gift of tongues. And we're going to see in chapter 14, tongues was elevated to the highest position. This makes you most spiritual. It was a big speaking gift. It was a kind of gift where people hear you. You're in the spotlight. And others, they had gifts of generosity, gifts of service, gifts of hospitality, all these other kind of gifts of help and compassion, they weren't upfront gifts. No one saw them. They weren't in the spotlight. During a worship service, you wouldn't see them. They had no part to play in the running of the service. And they begin to feel unimportant, irrelevant to the body. I remember so clearly growing up in my particular Pentecostal church, tongues was up here. And it was, if you spoke in tongues, it was evidence, as even Pastor Ian said last week, it was evidence that you had the Holy Spirit. And growing up as a young person, seeing all the older people speaking in tongues, and I wanted it so badly. And then they went through a period where every week they were inviting people at the front after a service to have people lay their hands on you so that you could speak in tongues. And I would come at the front, 10-year-old, 11-year-old, 12-year-old, begging God to speak in tongues. I want the Holy Spirit. I want it. I want it. I see it. I want it. And they would pray and they would pray and they would pray for me. Nothing would happen. Eventually, it got to the point where I went to the front and I kept on coming with other new people who would come. And then eventually, they started saying in my ear, just repeat after me. Repeat after me. And I felt like I was so much lesser because I couldn't do this. And this applies to all sorts of gifts. All sorts of gifts in the church. Now, we at CHBC, we don't, we don't teach that about spiritual gifts here. We don't teach you have to speak in tongues to have the Holy Spirit. That, we, don't, we don't believe that here. That's not evidence that you have the Holy Spirit. But we can assume, because we don't teach that theology, that we're now not in danger of, of, of that happening amongst us, right? And yet non-charismatic churches can unintentionally breed that kind of culture of inferiority. Unintentionally. How so? How does this happen in a church? By elevating certain ministries above others. Right? By always esteeming certain ministries of others. The children's ministry being most important. Or the music ministry being most important. Or the youth group is what we need to be all about. And if you're helping with that... You are doing the work that is necessary for Castleville and our community. Music ministry, whatever it is, we can elevate certain ministries. But what happens if you're not gifted, if God hasn't gifted you, gifted you for that particular ministry? What if you can't disciple younger people? What if you work on that night or that day of the week? What happens then? What about those who have the gift of hospitality and compassion, opening up their homes, or those who have the gift of care and support of driving people around and ministering to the needy and and, and those who need help? What about those? Do they ever get a mention? This culture is easily to breed. By elevating some gifts and ministries, we can unintentionally stir up envy in the church. People envying others, and we can stir up discontentment. In, in Paul's words, I, our ears start envying eyes, and feet start envying hands. What happens? Feet begin to lament about how much they hear what the hands have done and what the hands have built. And ears are tired of hearing about how clearly the eyes see, right? Envy 
and discontentment. It's a recipe for disaster because the ears become discontent and envious and the eyes become proud and boastful because they're always elevated. It's dangerous. So how does Paul deal with this? By the Spirit, how does he deal with this sad state? Well, two ways here. He shows them the wisdom of God and the sovereignty of God. Now look how he borrows from the body metaphor. Look what he does here, verse 17. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? Now look at verse 19. If they were all one part, where would the body be? What's he trying to say? Our differences are not something that we should bemoan. Our differences are meant to benefit each other and to benefit this world. Our varying gifts are meant to complement each other, not rivalry. And here, the irony is, if we all had the same gift, we'd be hindered in every way. If, if God made us all the same, we'd be hindered in every single way. And, and he uses a bit of humor here, right? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If they were all one part, where would the body be? He's saying, you know, just, just imagine if, the, if, a, if a body was made up of just hands, from top to bottom, just hands. That would be a sight to behold, right? Watching it walk. You wouldn't be able to watch a walk because you didn't have any eyes. And, and he's trying here to make, make a point. If everything was one body part, it would be ridiculous, grotesque. You wouldn't be able to do anything. And here he's, he's showing us that the church is different to everything else. I mean, just consider the business sector, right? It's, it's cutthroat for success. If you are weak or lesser, you're pushed out. You can't keep up. You can't meet the targets. And Paul says the church is nothing like that. The church is not like that. Because of the Spirit's work in our lives, you're essential to the body of Christ. You are. And and Paul's saying, please stay. Please serve. Please don't withdraw. You're needed here. The body needs you. So he shows them God's wisdom, and he shows them God's sovereignty. Look at verse 18. What did he say? But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, everyone, just as he wanted them to be. He arranged them, and he did it where he wanted. So God chose your giftings. Your leadership didn't. God gave them to you, and God is pleased with the ones that he gave you, the gifts he gave you. It says it pleased him what he allocated you. It has pleased God. That's why it says we are God's workmanship. We are his handiwork. So look at the detail that he put into the human eye. Look at the detail that he put into the human brain that we saw, the detail of the tongue. Look at his wisdom in all of that. And now he's saying, God has graciously saved you. He has graciously called you. And now he has graciously gifted you and given you a function. And it has pleased him. And he's put you right where he wants you to be in the body. And so if God has gifted you in that way, in a way that greatly pleases him, then it is, it is a tragedy to envy others, isn't it? If he is pleased with how he's created you, if you go and envy others, well, that's a sad state to be in. And so let me ask you, are you serving God? And are you serving his people in the way that he has gifted you? Are you doing that? Are you doing it? Because if you're envying others, envy leads to withdrawal. And then withdrawal leads to idleness. And then idleness leads to disobedience because you are not doing what he has gifted you and called you to do. Are you serving God and his people? And, and what happens, right? What happens when a church, when church members don't use their gifts? What happens? Well, the body begins to suffer need. And then what happens in a church? The, the church senses the need and other body parts start stepping up to try and fill the role. So you start getting feet that try and do the work that hands are supposed to do. And you get ears trying to do what eyes should be doing. And the body suffers. People serving in ways that God never gifted and called them to do. He's arranged us according to his wisdom. Serve him according to your gifts. And that's when true blessing comes. Grasping this will promote our unity. And so Paul's saying, don't withdraw. Don't envy. You are necessary to the body. Please stay. Please serve. Please be with the body of Christ. Verse 20, he repeats the phrase again. As it is, there are many parts, but one body. He repeats it again. 
Well, we've seen that envy has no place if we are a body, right? Now, next, I want to see being a body means there's no place for arrogance. So you've got those who envy, those who have certain roles, but now there's also no place for arrogance. Look what he does here. He's going to speak directly to those members, and he borrows again from the metaphor. Look at verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the hand cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. Here he is addressing arrogance. Now, the context of the letter is, again, those who had the superior gift are seeing themselves as essential and the others, you know, take it or leave it. We don't really need them. doesn't matter if they come tonight. Who cares? doesn't matter if they go to another church. doesn't matter. This is arrogance, he says here. Members treating themselves above others. The attitude of, I don't need you. Now, I've got an analogy here, a scenario that John Calvin gives. He's that 16th century theologian and pastor who was part of the Reformation. And I was just reminded as I walked into the doors tonight that today is Reformation Day. Um, Thanks to Dave McDougall, he reminded me. Um, But John Calvin gives this metaphoric scenario. And he says this. I've paraphrased it because he speaks old language. Um, He says this. Imagine the hands, the mouth teeth and tongue all conspired against the stomach. Each of them was sick of caring for the stomach and its constant and frequent demands. So the hands said to the other members, we won't carry any food to the mouth. The mouth joined in and said, I won't accept any food that's offered to me from anyone. The teeth also chimed in and said, even if something gets in, I won't chew it. Lastly, the tongue joined in and said, I'll be the last line of defense, and I won't let anything get down past the throat. So with an angry spirit, the hands, mouth, teeth, and tongue conspired against the stomach to beat it into submission. However, they soon realized that they were becoming increasingly weak. Not just them, but the whole body was beginning to shut down. It soon became incredibly clear that the stomach, which needed regular attention, was no inferior member. The stomach was not only a consumer, but a giver. Its demand to be nourished was so that it could nourish the rest of the body. You see, the point that he's making, the prominent members rising above and looking down on the lesser members, soon realizing how much they need the lesser members. This attitude stems from this individualistic independence, inflated view of self, the I don't need others kind of mentality. And for example, we esteem those figures like Bear Grylls, right? Because he conquers and he weathers it all alone, right? He doesn't need anyone. We esteem the individual who climbs to the top from nothing, who who gets there and achieves success by sheer determination and no help from the outside. We admire those people. You know who the perfect example of this kind of person is? It is the Christian who could come to church but doesn't because they see no need. Right? They feel no need. They think they can do it alone. They see no benefit in coming to church. It's just them and God. And they are eyes saying to the ears, I have no need of you. I don't. I can do this. But understand, it's not sufficient for Christians to just have a Christian friend instead of church. Why not? Because the body is made up of more than two limbs, isn't it? It's dependent, as we've already seen. The body needs lungs, kidneys, liver, blood, neck, spine, and you could go on. Let me quote what David Garland says here. Quote, One person alone, no matter how gifted, cannot play a Beethoven symphony cannot act a Shakespearean tragedy or compete against another team. The same is true in the church. It can never be a solo performance. End quote. God is showing us, yes, we are individual members. You're an individual person. You're individual members, but we are interdependent. We need each other. We need each other. It's, it's happened so many times. It, for example, when I've done a, a visit, when I've gone to visit someone or meet up with someone, and you spend some time, you chat and close in prayer. And as you're leaving, the person, the member might say, you know, thank you so much for visiting. Thank you for the encouragement. I really needed this. Thank you. 
And inevitably, every time, I am absolutely compelled to say, don't you understand? I needed this too. Thank you. I needed the fellowship. See, it's not just that they needed me and I didn't need them. I needed them. We both needed the fellowship. We are members of one body. The temptation for this arrogance, right, that Paul deals with here, of some looking down on others, this is especially a temptation for those who are in a leadership position, those who have a higher office, especially a temptation. Pastors, elders, deacons, ministry leaders, staff workers, any kind of upfront role, because certain roles can tend to lead to the spotlight, and the spotlight can quickly and soon lead to pride and arrogance, because you run the service. Right? You run things around here. You run the ministry. And then you start looking at some people, others as dispensable, while you yourself are vital. Your gifting that God's given you, your ministry, it's absolutely necessary for the kingdom of God. But if that person leaves, we march on. It's especially dangerous temptation for leaders, especially dangerous. And Paul calls this out. And how does he address this spirit of arrogance? How does he do it? Well, again, he borrows from the metaphor. Look at verses 22 to 23. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. So he says the parts of the body, firstly there, that seem weaker, they are indispensable. And listen, every single one of you know this to be true, don't you? If you break one toe, one toe, running is impossible. Walking is agony and difficult. Is it one little toe? If, for example, if you uh, one of your nerves in the back, a thin, tiny nerve, if that becomes pinched, or if that something starts pressing against that, you can't move, you can't sleep. A tiny nerve in comparison to your whole body. You need that nerve free, don't you? You need it. And, and what about one disc out of your whole spine? What about one disc? If that's slightly out, you're gone. You're crippled. Forget about working. Forget about getting out of bed. It's finished. And he says here, the weaker parts are indispensable. And we know that by experience. And he says the same in the church. The same in the church. And then he says the less honorable are treated with special honor. Now, the honorable parts of of a body seem to often be the the eyes, the arms, the legs. They're the ones that are on display. They're the ones that seem to be doing all the work. The hands get all the notice. The eyes are what you continually see, right? They seem to be the honorable ones. They're the hard workers. They get the recognition. But what's interesting is you can survive without an eye. You can survive without hands. You can survive without feet. You can. But then you get the less honorable parts that he said. They get special honor. What's he referring to there? Well, think about the inner parts of our body, the inner organs, the blood vessels, the kidney, the liver. They're not pretty at all. They're not pretty. And they're never seen. You don't see them. They get no attention whatsoever. And yet, if they are out of place, if they are missing, you can't survive. And so, those unseen, unattractive parts that never see the light of day, They get the special honor because they keep the body alive. These hidden workers behind the scenes, they're the real heroes. That's what he's saying here. And they get the special honor. One writer says this, quote, These organs are so vital that God had them enclosed and protected by our skeleton. They are given the greater honor. Do you see how they get the special honor? He protects them with the skeleton. That's how vital they are. And then he goes on to say, parts that are unpresentable we treat with special modesty. Now, you don't have to have a PhD in anatomy to get what he's saying at here. He's trying not to be crude, but he's referring to female and male genitalia. That's what he's saying here, the parts that are unpresentable. In modern English, we would say our private parts, right? And here he says, we treat them with special modesty, just like Adam and Eve did immediately. They covered them. And what he's saying is here, we treat them with special modesty. Uh, modesty. He's saying it doesn't mean because they're hidden they have no role. That's that he's trying to say just because they're not to be seen doesn't mean they don't have a role. Without them, it's so obvious there's no more human race. We face extinction. 
So even the parts that are hidden, that never make the light of day in the church service, that you never hear about, we give special treatment to because they further, they further the work. They further work. We treat with special modesty. We treat them with great care. Do you see the wisdom in God in all of this, right? Do you see his wisdom in how he's designed the human body? Eyes, arms, and legs. They're the hard workers who get the attention, yet you can survive without them. But the weaker ones, the less honorable ones, the ones that aren't seen, you cannot survive without them. So the weaker ones God chooses in the human body to give the greater honor. And so he likens the church to the human body so that you don't get wrapped up in your pastors. And you don't start doing what the Corinthians were doing. I'm of Apollos. I'm of Cephas. I'm of Paul. Don't do that. Don't do that. Do not follow men. This is what God is doing. Every member is necessary. Do you remember what Jesus said about greatness? The greatest among you is the servant of all. The servant of all. And Jesus proves himself to be the greatest of all, right? He comes, the king of glory, washing feet. What is he doing? And then he walks and he is crucified. He is crucified for sinners, for you and for me. And he dies a death. He lays down his life. There's no greater love than one who lays down his life. And he does it for sinners. The greatest of all among us is not those who are here behind the pulpit on the stage. It's a servant of all who keep the body going. They get the greater honor. Well, let me just finish up lastly here. Our last point of God's order of the body. And I'm only going to make just a couple of comments and we'll wrap up here. Look at verses 27 to 28. Now you are, look, he's been giving the metaphor, right? And he hits it, verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And in the church, God has appointed first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracle, those who have gifts of healing, those able to help others, those who give some administration, those who speak in different kinds of tongues. Verse 27 there. You are the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. Think about the implications in that. When Christ came to earth, he ministered in his earthly body, right? Where is Christ now? He's in heaven. How is he ministering? Christ is on earth now through his body, his people. We are his lips and we speak his gospel to this world. We are his hands and we're about our father's work. We are his feet and we run around doing his errands in this world. Paul says, you are Christ's body. Christ is very much ministering in this world, though he's in heaven. You're his body now and you're on earth and you are to serve And then he shows them that there are some giftings that have an important place in the church. It's not just a free-for-all. He's put some structure here. He's put some order here. And he shows that there are some primary gifts that the church is built upon. And you'll notice that by the language in verse 28. He says, firstly, secondly, thirdly. This is kind of almost like ranking language, kind of like importance. This is how you have to build up. Okay, there is still order here, though every member is necessary. There's still order. First, second, third. Firstly, you have the apostles. These are the 12 eyewitnesses. They saw his resurrection. They received the Spirit. They wrote most of our New Testament. And that's why the early church, Acts 2, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The church was built on that. And every, and every church generation since devotes themselves to the apostles' teaching. They wrote our New Testament. So we give the word every week. And then he goes on to say, second prophets, third teachers. I won't touch on that because Pastor Ian has already gone through that. But what you see about first, second, and third, he stops the numbering after that, right? First, second, and third, what do they all have in common? They're all word-related ministries. They're all proclamation of the, of the word ministries and gifts. And God says, this is what the church is built upon. This is how the church is built up. Now, due to size or location, a church may not have a youth group. 
A church may not have a play group. A church may not even have many ministries in the community. There might be no social ministries in that church because of its size and location. But every church, every church has to have the teaching of the Word of God. Has to. Otherwise, it's not a church. That is how churches are planted. That is how Christians are built up and encouraged. And this is how people are converted. And so he gives this. And then he goes on to list all the other all the other gifts, you'll see them there. And I don't want to go through them. Can I just mention two here? And these are very important. I hope they're helpful to CHBC. He lists some of them there. Pastor Ian's gone through, through them, so please don't come up to me saying, why didn't you? You'll see there the gift there, the gift of administration. Now, because of our modern context, we misunderstand that. When we think admin, we think the person at the front who does the typing and all of that. That's not what it's referring to here. The word in the Greek there refers to a pilot who steers a ship. That's what the word there means. They guide a congregation. They give the right direction so we get to the right destination. These people who have this gift, they're really wise. They give they give wise counsel. They give wise advice. They make wise decisions. And understand this. This gift is not limited to pastors, elders, or high officers. This is given to the church. Wise men, wise women make wise decisions for the church. Then you'll see the other gift there, helping others. It's literally in the Greek, the gift of help. This is those who help the, the weak and needy, the vulnerable, the lonely, the sick. They give counsel and encouragement. They put up accommodation. They drive elderly to appointments. They make meals. Understand, we have so many people at CHBC who have this spiritual gift, the gift of help. This is not general help. This is a supernatural spiritual gift of help. We have so many here at this church. It's incredible. It is incredible. And they shoot a card, they shoot a text, they go and visit, they go and drive, they take people around, they make meals, they flood doorsteps with meals, they care for one another, and it's all behind the scenes. You don't even know who they are. You'll, they'll never get announced from the pulpit. Never, never. It's completely behind the scenes. And yet they live and experience the words of Jesus. It's more blessed to give than to receive. They, they live by that, knowing that that's, that's absolutely real. And, and they have this keen awareness of the needs of others. They are Christ-like, right? Christ knew our need. He came and he met it. These people who have this gift, they just know the needs they're around and they need it. Unpaid, unseen, unmentioned. It's an incredible gift. And so after this gift, he wants to fix their attitude. We close verse 29 to 31 there. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all have gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret, but eagerly desire the greater gift. Now, now I will show you the most excellent way. Now that line there is our bridge for next week. This is the bridge into one of the most popular chapters in the Bible that unbelievers know. That line there is the bridge. And now he's going to speak on love. Now, what does this tell us? As we finish on this, what does this tell us? He lands on that line. I'm going to show you the most excellent way. This is what we need to understand. It's absolutely important that you use your gift, but that's not the only thing that's important. It's also how you use your gift. Not just that you use it, but how you use it. And now he's going to teach us how we use it. And he's going to show us the way of love. Okay? So as we close, we see here, chapter 12, do your own reading. The human body is filled with this room, is a living sermon to us. And it rings out every day, 365 days of the year. Every time you see the body in the mirror, every time you see a family member, when you go to work and see your boss, when you go to the shops, there is a sermon that is being preached everywhere you go. That we are one body made up of many members and we've each been called for the furtherance of the gospel and the kingdom of God. So will our different gifts unite us, CHBC, or will they divide us like Corinth? May we take Paul's words by the Holy Spirit to heart. Let me pray. Father God, we uh, thank you for 
the sermon that is all around us, the human body, we thank you for your great wisdom in how you created the human body, the peak of your creation. And we thank you that we now have become the body of Christ, each member. And I pray that you would be showing us, please weigh upon our hearts that each of us have been called. Show us what these giftings are. And God, I pray for all of us in whatever capacity you've given us that we might serve, serve each other, serve this world, that we might do good, that we might glorify you and help us to be content with the way that you've gifted us. Lord, it's so easy for us to be discouraged. Lord, I pray for people in this church who do so much, maybe even in this room, who do so much and never get recognized. I pray that your word would bless them tonight. And I pray that those who are in more of the upfront ministries, God, who, who, who maybe are regularly congratulated, regularly thanked, I pray that you would keep them humble. Please keep them humble, that they would not be arrogant and that others would not be envious. Oh God, may, may we have such harmony and unity. May we be in sync so that we might be of maximum benefit. For your glory, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we have one last song. Thanks, guys.